Hello everyone, welcome back to this series called Finance Current Affairs, where we pick up some important financial topics and we try and discuss them with the help of different questions. So before I move on to the first question, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, please do subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you can be notified about all our upcoming videos. If you want the free PDF of this session, you can join the Telegram group. The link is in the description below. We provide the free PDFs on that very group. Now moving on to the first question that says, which of the following are the domestic systemically important banks that are the DSIBs as per the RBI released 2021 list of such banks? So recently RBI came up with the 2021 list of those banks which are considered domestic systemically important. So let's first try and understand the concept of DSIBs and then we'll come back to the question and answer it. So talking about domestic systemically important banks, first of all, we can easily understand the concept from the very name systemically important. So the banks which have a major importance as far as your whole financial system is concerned. If something goes wrong with these banks, then it can have a drastic impact on the overall economy. So there are certain banks like we say, suppose SBI. Okay, they have so much, uh, they have such a big size, they are so complex, they have so much of the interconnectedness with the other banks, with the other financial institutions, with other kinds of institutions. There are so many customers who are utilizing the services of this bank. So if anything goes wrong with this bank, then it will have uh, the effects on all the other kinds of institutions, all the customers and the economy at large. So systemically important banks are those banks which because of certain factors are considered really very important for the system and they are too big to fail. By too big to fail, I mean that if some kind of problem comes up with these banks or they are on the verge of failing, then it is going to have a major impact on the economy. So to protect the economy from such a situation, the government might provide the support to those banks. So we can't afford the failure of those banks because it can have a major impact on overall economy. It can disrupt the economy. So those banks are systemically important banks, which have a very major importance in the whole system and their failure can disrupt the economy. So they are considered systemically important based on their size, based on the cross jurisdiction activities which they are taking because of their complexity, because of their lack of substitutability and interconnectedness. Unka bahut hi major size hai, bahut se assets liabilities hai jis mein wo deal kar rahe hai. Not only they are just restricted to their own boundaries, they are conducting the business across the geographies. So it's going to have spillover effects on the other countries as well. Then it is so complex, incurring a lot of cost, offering various variety of services. So it can impact the economy and or as a whole. Then there is lack of substitutability. The kind of services which they are providing at the cost which they are providing at the, at the quality which they are providing, no one else can substitute that service in a similar way. So it is so important for the economy that if there is no problem, it will be difficult to substitute and they have a lot of interconnectedness with the other institutions, other markets as well. So they are systemically important. All right. So as they are considered too big to fail, government is likely to provide them the support at times of distress. And their failure can disrupt the services of banking which they are providing and they can have a major impact on the other economic activities as well. That's why RBI separately releases a list of these banks and they have to take care of much more regulation than the other banks. So they have more capital requirements, more rules, regulations to be adhered to than the banks which are not that very systemically important. So Domestic systemically important banks means that within the nation, the banks which are categorized as systematic, systemically important by the national authorities. We have global systemically important banks as well. The uh, institution or we can say the body which comes up with the Basel uh, norms, it uh, provides the global systemically important banks framework. But when the national authorities, like in case of India, the RBI is into this work of identifying the banks which are systemically important based on different criteria, 
that framework is domestically system domestic systemically important banks framework which was released by rbi in 2014 so in banks ko identify karna bahut zaruri hai kyunki inka failure aapki economy ko affect kar sakta hai so the dsib's framework is basically the framework where assessment of banks is done by the national authorities and then they see that how these banks can impact the system and their failure can affect the overall economy so this framework was released in 2014 okay and since then the rbi releases a list of those banks which are systemically important which are categorized under different buckets so different buckets means different classifications four to five buckets are there okay and in whichever bucket a bank lies in that that means in whichever category a bank lies based on that there is certain regulatory criteria which they have to follow so let's discuss that as well see four indicators are used and based on these four indicators the banks are given a score the indicators are the size of that very bank how interconnected it is how easy or difficult it is to substitute its services with that of other institutions and how complex it is इन चार क्राइटेरिया के बेसिस पे बैंक्स को स्कोर किया जाता है बेस्ड ऑन द स्कोरिंग दे आर वट एवर स्कोर दे ऑप्टेन दे आर देन कैटेगराइज अंडर डिफरेंट बकेट्स द मोर द स्कोर दैट मीन्स मोर इंपॉर्टेंट इज दैट वेरी बैंक फॉर द ओवरऑल सिस्टम सो दे हैव फाइव कैटेगरीज इन फिफ्थ कैटेगरी वी डोंट हैव एनी बैंक एज ऑफ नाउ ओके अभी तक फिफ्थ कैटेगरी में इतना ज्यादा सिस्टमिकली इंपॉर्टेंट कोई बैंक नहीं बना है as far as the india is concerned so based on whichever bucket the bank lies it has to maintain additional common equity tier 1 capital now we know that banks have to maintain tier 1 capital okay uh, we do its assessment under the pca framework also basel requirement is there and in the addition to whatever capital the banks are maintaining they have to maintain the common equity tier 1 capital common equity tier 1 capital is certain core capital maintained in the form of equity by the bank so bank jo core capital jo aap shares ke form mein rakhta hai retained earnings ke form mein rakhta hai wo equity form mein rakhta hai that is common equity tier 1 capital and banks need to maintain this capital Uh, against the risky assets which they are having okay these this very capital is going to help them during the stressful times so common equity tier 1 capital wo part hai regulatory capital ka jo aapko stressful situations ke sath deal karne mein sabse pehle helpful hoti hai sabse pehle isi ke through hum losses absorb karte hain jab bhi koi crisis type ki situation aaye so it's the highest quality regulatory capital that is used as a precautionary measure to protect the economy during crisis and it's the bank score capital including your equity shares including your retained earnings and all okay so kuch risky assets ke against aapko common equity tier 1 capital rakhni hoti and these systemically important banks they have to maintain additional set 1 capital which the other banks are maintaining baki banks ke muqable inko kuch aur additional set capital bhi rakhni hoti hai risky related assets ke against so the banks which are under first bucket they need to maintain 0.20% of the risky weighted assets in the form of set 1 capital okay then the uh, banks which lie under the second bucket for them the criteria is 0.40% of the risk weighted assets for bucket 3 it is 0.60% for bucket 4 0.80% and for bucket 5 it is 1% of the risk weighted assets so now let's see the list of the banks and which banks lie in which way bucket as per the RBI's framework so RBI ne recently ye notification nikali hai jahan unhone bataya hai ki kaun sa bank kis bucket mein hai but uh, before that one more thing which i want to tell you is that suppose there is a foreign bank and it is having a branch in india koi foreign branch bank hai jiski branch india mein hai and globally that bank is categorized as a systemically important bank ऑल्दो इंडिया में तो हम अपने यहाँ के बैंक को ही डोमेस्टिक सिस्टमिकली इम्पोर्टेंट बैंक के हिसाब से कैटेगराइज करते हैं बट वट एवर आर द ग्लोबल स्टैंडर्ड ग्लोबल फ्रेमवर्क एज पर विच इफ सर्टन ग्लोबल फॉरन बैंक इज ग्लोबल सिस्टमिकली इम्पोर्टेंट बैंक एंड दैट बैंक इज हैज इज बेसिकली रनिंग इन इंडिया थ्रू इट्स ब्रांच देन अदर देन वट एवर कैपिटल रिक्वायरमेंट इट इज फुलफिलिंग अकॉर्डिंग टू जी एस आई बीज क्राइटेरिया इन इंडिया ऑल्सो इट नीड्स टू मेंटेन एडिशनल सी ई I, uh, additional common equity tier one, 
which will be based on the risky weighted assets they are having in India. So globally, जो उनको capital maintain करनी है वो तो वो कर रहे हैं लेकिन अगर वो इंडिया में फंक्शन कर रहे हैं और वो सिस्टमिकली इंपॉर्टेंट है तो उन्हें इंडिया में जो उनके रिस्की वेटेड असेट्स हैं उसके अगेंस्ट भी एडिशनल इक्विटी कैपिटल होल्ड करके रखनी है देन टॉकिंग अबाउट द रिसेंट लिस्ट विच बैंक आर अंडर द डोमेस्टिक सिस्टमिकली इंपॉर्टेंट बैंक लिस्ट सो थ्री बैंक आर अंडर दिस लिस्ट सो इंडिया में कौन से तीन मेजर बैंक हैं जो बहुत लार्ज स्केल पे फंक्शन कर रहे हैं इट इज एस बी आई आई सी आई सी आई एंड एच डी एफ सी सो दीज थ्री बैंक आर दी डोमेस्टिक सिस्टमिकली इंपॉर्टेंट बैंक फॉर इंडिया एस बी आई जो है ये थर्ड बकेट में है दैट मीन्स इट हैज टू मेंटेन पॉइंट सिक्स जीरो परसेंट ऑफ इट्स रिस्क्वेटेड असेट्स एज दी एडिशनल कॉमन इक्विटी टीयर वन कैपिटल एंड आई सी आई सी आई एंड एच डी एफ सी बैंक दे आर इन दी फर्स्ट बकेट सो दिस इज द डेटा ऑफ द 2021 list which has been released. अगर हम इसको पिछले बार की लिस्ट से कंपेयर करें सो लास्ट ईयर ऑल्सो दीज थ्री बैंक फॉर अंडर द सेम बकेट ओके बट प्रायरली इफ आई टॉक अबाउट द टाइम्स ऑफ ट्वेंटी एट दैट टाइम एच डी एफ सी वॉज नॉट अ पार्ट ऑफ डोमेस्टिक सिस्टमिकली इंपॉर्टेंट बैंक सबसे पहले अगर हम बात करें दो हजार पंद्रह सोलह की तब एस बी आई और आई सी आई सी आई ही डोमेस्टिक सिस्टमिकली इंपॉर्टेंट बैंक थे देन एज फॉर द डेटा कलेक्टेड इन ट्वेंटी सेवेंटीन एच डी एफ सी वॉज ऑल्सो एडेड एंड सिंस देन दीज थ्री बैंक आर डोमेस्टिक सिस्टमिकली इंपॉर्टेंट बैंक ऑफ इंडिया कमिंग बैक टू आर क्वेश्चन नाउ वी हैव टू आइडेंटिफाई दी डोमेस्टिक सिस्टमिकली इंपॉर्टेंट बैंक ICICI and SBI. So answer is option C, one, two, and three. Now coming to the second question. It says, which of the following correctly states the reason behind the deficit of nine point six billion US dollars in the current account in second quarter of twenty twenty one twenty twenty two? So on the RBI website, a notification came regarding the BOP. बीओपी स्टेटस इन इंडिया सो हमारा करंट अकाउंट का स्टेटस क्या है कैपिटल अकाउंट का स्टेटस क्या है दैट हैज बीन प्रोवाइडेड थ्रू दिस नोटिफिकेशन सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल व्हेन आई टॉक अबाउट द बीओपी वी हैव करंट एंड कैपिटल अकाउंट एंड सी मेजर अकाउंट्स हियर अंडर द करंट अकाउंट व्हाट टाइप ऑफ ट्रांजैक्शंस टू बी रिकॉर्ड वी रिकॉर्ड द एक्सपोर्ट एंड इंपोर्ट ऑफ गुड गुड्स द एक्सपोर्ट एंड इंपोर्ट्स ऑफ सर्विसेज द यूनिलेटरल वन साइडेड ट्रांसफर्स लाइक वी माइट बी रिसीविंग और गिविंग सम काइंड ऑफ ग्रांड्स सम काइंड ऑफ एड्स वी माइट बी रिसीविंग और पेइंग द रेमिटेंसेस लाइक समवन फ्रॉम इंडिया रिसाइड्स इन अदर कंट्री एंड इज सेंडिंग रेमिटेंस टू इंडिया सेंडिंग बैक द मनी टू इंडिया सो दे आर यूनिलेटरल ट्रांसफर्स दे फॉर्म पार्ट ऑफ द सेकेंडरी इनकम देन वी ऑल्सो हैव सम इन्वेस्टमेंट इनकम कॉल दी प्राइमरी इनकम लाइक यू माइट हैव इन्वेस्टेड एल्सवेयर एंड यू माइट बी अर्निंग सम इंटरेस्ट यू माइट बी अर्निंग सम प्रॉफिट्स सो इफ द मनी इज कमिंग दैट इज इन इफ यू आर पेइंग द इंटरेस्ट द प्रॉफिट्स एल्सवेयर दैट्स एन आउटफ्लो सो दीज आर फोर थिंग्स विच आर कवर्ड अंडर करेंट अकाउंट primary income secondary income export and import of goods and export and imports of services export and import of goods is basically the balance of trade so when can we have current account deficit obviously if we our imports are more than the exports okay we eat goods we eat services so agar hamara trade deficit hai to hamare deficit current account mein deficit ho sakta hai if we have deficit as far as the services are concerned then we can have a current account deficit or when our unilateral payments are more than what we are receiving then we can have a deficit or when the in incomes which we are paying outside are more than what we are receiving then also we can have a deficit so we have to find out the reasons of the deficit in this second quarter of 2021 2022 if i look at these options first one says that trade deficit widen and there is increase in the overseas payments which we are making so this can be a reason for the current account deficit But if we look at the other options, they are all together eliminated. Let's see how. अगर हमारा trade deficit reduce हो रहा है, that means our exports are more and our imports are less, and our investment income payments are decreasing, then we are likely to have a surplus than having a deficit. So this option gets eliminated. Then the remaining two options talk about FDI and FPI. They are not part of current account. They are part of the capital account. So these two options are also eliminated. Okay, as of now, none of the above cannot be the answer if answer A is correct. So there can be different reasons for the current account deficit in this quarter. Let's see what have been the actual reasons. So talking about the uh, features of BOP, 
So second quarter of 2021-2022 saw current account in a deficit of 9.6 billion US dollars. अगर मैं इसको पिछले क्वार्टर से कंपेयर करूं और पिछले साल सेम क्वार्टर से कंपेयर करूं, so both of those showed a surplus, but now we are having a deficit. So in previous quarter there was 6.6 billion US dollars worth of surplus. In same quarter, previous year also we had a 15.3 billion US dollar surplus, but this time we are having a deficit in current account. So there have been two major reasons of this deficit. First is the increase in the trade deficit. That means the imports of goods have been more as compared to exports. You can see current account is in deficit, it's 9.6. Okay, and the major reason is the deficit in the goods, which is 44.4 billion worth. Or trade deficit. Other reason contributing is that the primary income payments have increased vis-a-vis -vis what we are receiving. So, हम जो बाहर payments कर रहे हैं, income payments कर रहे हैं, इन इन लोगों ने invest किया, उस पे income हमको pay कर रहे हैं, that has increased, which has contributed to the deficit. So, we can see the primary income in the deficit. This is the figure. Okay. So, these two, these two have been the major reasons for the deficit. Other than that, if you see, have a look at the services, then there is a surplus in that regard. So our exports have been more. And if I talk about the secondary income, it is also having a surplus. That means we have received more remittances, received more grants, aids, received more secondary income than what we have paid. So this was about the current account. Talking about the capital account, it is in surplus. All right. So capital account figures show that the foreign direct investment. Inflow is less than the year ago, but still it is in surplus. FPI is also less than it what it was in the previous year. Net external commercial borrowing recorded an inflow which was of 4.1 billion, and the non-resident deposits outflow is 0.8 US billion US dollars, which was around 1.9 billion inflow in the last year's same quarter. Okay, so this is the detail of the capital account, and overall it has been in surplus. And if I talk about the private transfer receipts, the remittances which we have been uh, getting from the overseas, it has increased. So that's why we were having a secondary income at a positive figure. You can see over here eighteen point nine. Now coming to the forex reserves so we have seen a increase in the forex reserves hamari forex reserves 31.2 billion us dollars increase we is quarter mein one major reason for the same is that sdrs were allocated by the imf to ye ho gaya hamara data is quarter ka second quarter ka if i talk about the first half year of 2021 2022 what have been the figures so current account was in 0.2% of gdp deficit net fti inflows were lower Than what it was in first half year of previous year, portfolio investment recorded an inflow of 42.3 billion US dollars in this very first half year, which was less than what it was in the previous year's first half year. Then uh, the increase in reserves in this half year was of about 63.1 billion US dollars. So, ये हमारा first half year का data है. Basically, you must be aware about the current account deficit in this quarter and the reasons behind that deficit. So now, as we have already discussed, both of these, which have been stated in option A, were the reasons behind the deficit. So answer is option A. Now coming to the third question, that says, identify the statements correctly related to the framework for facilitating small value digital payments in offline modes. so we have discussed various reports of rbi we have discussed various speeches that came up on the rbi website and we have always heard about this thing that rbi is working on offering the digital payments in the rural areas in the semi urban areas where people are not having good enough internet connectivity so kaise hum un areas mein jahan internet penetration itni nahi hai jahan smartphone penetration itni nahi hai wahan bhi hum digital payments provide kar paaye is pe rbi kaafi work kar raha hai various solutions came up and they are under process in the sandbox in direct under the regulatory sandbox under the rbi's innovation hub such things uh, is somewhat where rbi is working upon 
So now it has released a framework where these digital payments will be available in offline mode, but that is just for some small value transactions. So let's discuss briefly about that framework and then we'll come back to the question and identify correct statements. First of all, what do I mean by offering digital payments in offline mode? This means that you are digitally services to provide services, but you don't need the internet or telecom connectivity. So a transaction not requiring internet or telecom connectivity is an offline digital payment. So you need to be physically present to make that payment and using your cards, using your e-wallets, using your mobile devices, you can easily make the payment without the need of having a telecom or the internet connectivity. So you phone pay message, aega, OTP, you don't need internet, ki nahi hai. Aapki payments will you need to be physically present for making that payment, okay? So why RBI has introduced this framework? In order to increase the digital transactions access in the poor uh, or weak internet areas, in the areas, in the various rural and semi-urban areas where people were not having the option for these digital transactions. So what does this framework say? It says that all the authorized payment system providers, operators, uh, and uh, if if they want to provide such types of services, then they have to adhere to certain requirements. So, jitne bhi acquirer and issuer banks ya non-banks hai, suppose the customer is having a card of some bank, an e-wallet of some bank or some non-bank entity or if you are making the payment to some merchant and that merchant has a bank. Um, so, if those banks, those non-bank entities want to provide this solution to the customers where digital payments can be made in the offline mode, then they have to adhere to certain rules. Let's discuss those rules. First of all, the rule is that the offline payments can be made through different channels. A customer ke paas agar cards hai, okay, that they have the cards issued by the banks, they have the wallets, they have the mobile devices. So using them, they can pay, they can make the offline payments. Abhi tak kya hota tha, aapko mobile se payment karni hai. Suppose we have to make a payment through the mobile, we need internet connectivity. We have e-wallet to make the payment, we need internet connectivity. Now that can be done without internet connectivity for small value transactions in certain areas. So for that, what is required? Proximity. That means in face-to-face -face mode, that transaction can happen. And additional factor authentication will not be needed because... Uh, the things are happening offline, so there is a time lag which is involved. Usually when we do the transaction online, we get an OTP, we get an SMS. So that's basically an additional factor authentication. Verification purposes, ke liye, authenticate karne ke liye ki sahi jaga, sahi persons ko transactions ho rahe hai, SMS aata hai, OTP aata hai. So that is not going to be offered in this case because Transactions are offline, okay, and these alerts, if they will be sent also, there will be a time lag because there is no connectivity, no telecom and internet connectivity involved. That's why there is no need for additional factor authentication. Moreover, the payment instruments will be enabled with the customer consent. Customer consent dega to hi ye transaction ho paenge. And the upper limit for the transaction is rupee 200. Ek bari mein aap 200 rupee ki transaction kar sakte ho. And total limit for all the offline transactions which you are doing with that payment instrument is 2000. Once you use that 2000 limit, then you need to replenish your limit. And for replenishing, you need the online mode. Aapki replenishment is 2000 rupees ki online hi ho paegi, wo offline nahi hogi. So ek bari mein aap 200 rupee tak ka transaction kar sakte ho. And ek point in time mein aap total offline transactions jo kar sakte ho us instrument se wo 2000 tak ki hai. After that, you need to renew your limit. So, acquire will be li liable for liabilities if some technical security issue arises at the merchant's end. Aap kisi ko payment kar rahe ho, us merchant ke uh, end se aapko koi technical issue aara hai because of which the payment is not getting processed. Then, the bank of that very merchant will be, that is the acquirer bank, will be liable for all the costs associated. And under this scheme or under this framework, the customers have the grievance redressal mechanism, which is the integrated ombudsman scheme. So, in case, this case, if a customer has any problem, then RBI has recently scheme launched ki thi, integrated ombudsman scheme. Uske under wo apni grievance ko redress kara sakta hai. So, these were the key requirements of this framework. Now, coming back to the question and identifying the correct statements. So, offline payments can be made using any channel, cards, wallets, mobile. This is correct. 
Offline payments will be made in phase two. In phase mode only, this is correct. Offline payment transactions requires the additional factor of authentication, which is mandatory. No, it's not mandatory. Upper limit is five hundred per transaction. No, it's P two hundred with total being two thousand. So it's incorrect. Only first two are correct. Answer is option A. Now moving on to the last question. That says, who of the following is not an executive director of RBI? So recently, two people have been appointed as the executive director of RBI. Let's see. Who are they, and who are the other executive directors, and which of the following is not an executive director? So RBI recently appointed Sri Ajay Kumar Chaudhary as the executive director of RBI on third of January. Before that, he was the chief general manager in charge, Department of Supervision. So he was working with RBI as a chief general manager. And now, after being appointed as the executive director, he is going to look after the fintech department, the risk monitoring department, and your inspection department of RBI. All right. So he is the first uh, a person appointed as the executive director recently. The second one is Dr. Deepak Kumar. So he has also been appointed as the executive director on same date. And uh, before that, he was the head of the department of IT of RBI. Okay, and now as an executive director, he will be working in the foreign exchange department, department of communication, and he will also be looking after the deposit insurance and credit guarantee corporation, which is a subsidiary of RBI. So, अब इनका ये role होने वाला है. Talking about the organization structure, where do executive directors stand? So, the topmost is the central board of directors, and then who is appointed the governor? Mr. Shakti Kant Das is the governor. Then we have the deputy governors and below them we have executive directors. So अभी हम executive directors की बात कर रहे हैं जो काफी higher level पे आते हैं overall RBI की positions की बात करें तो below them we have principal, chief general managers, chief general managers, general managers, deputy general managers, assistant general managers, manager, assistant manager and then we have some support staff. So ये आपकी hierarchy है organization structure की. So The governor, if I talk about, is Sri Shakti Kanta Das, and we have four deputy governors: Sri M K Jain, Dr M D Patra, Sri M R Rao, and Sri T Ravi Shankar. So coming back to uh, the executive directors, so this is the list of the executive directors, and as you can see, Anil Kumar Sharma, Sri S C Murmu, Dr O P Murmu. So you can see over here. श्री अजय कुमार श्री ए के चौधरी डॉक्टर दीपक कुमार द रिसेंट अपॉइंटमेंट्स आर मैं हैव ऑलरेडी बीन एडेड अंडर द लिस्ट ऑफ एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर्स ऑल राइट नाउ कमिंग बैक टू द क्वेश्चन एंड आइडेंटिफाइंग हु इज नॉट एन एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर डॉक्टर एम डी पात्रा इज नॉट द एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर ही इज द डेप्यूटी गवर्नर सो दिस इज इन करेक्ट हु इज नॉट एन एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर इज आंसर ई विद दिस आई वुड लाइक टू एंड अप दिस सेशन आई होप इट वॉज यूजफुल फॉर यू ऑल थैंक यू सो मच